My reporting had long focused on those who take advantage of the high seas to murder, enslave, dump, and steal. But the romance, wilderness, and lawlessness of that frontier has also inspired mavericks, renegades, and visionaries. An array of swashbuckling characters who use the murky laws of the high seas to dream up alternative world orders, utopian safe havens. But the question for me is whether these creations will become island nations or remain island notions. Two thirds of the planet is covered by water. It's our planet's wildest frontier, breathtaking as much as it is vital to all life. A place of discovery and endless reinvention, a metaphor for freedom, as well as a profoundly dystopian realm where the darkest of all humanities play out. Over 50 million people work at sea and human rights and environmental abuses often occur with impunity. Six, of you. Six people are sleeping in there. So hot. This is, un I've never ever seen this bad. My name is Ian Urbina. As a journalist, I've spent the past decade reporting from this lawless frontier. I run an investigative journalism organization called The Outlaw Ocean Project that reports about crimes happening in this space. This is the Outlaw Ocean. This is Radio Carolina. Caroline, it's 1965. The BBC and other broadcasters are only playing popular music late at night, leaving young audiences starved for more. Rogue DJs turn to the Outlaw Ocean aboard ships in the rough North Sea, just beyond the reach of British laws, pirate radio stations are born. They quickly attract millions of listeners. Millions of kids have learned to say, I love Caroline on 199, and they lap it up from six in the morning until eight o'clock at night. One such pirate broadcaster was Patty Roy Bates. He took this legal quirk a step further. On Christmas Eve of 1966, he motored a small boat seven miles off the coast of England to a rusty, abandoned anti-aircraft tower. At the time, Ruff's tower lay just outside British waters. Inspired with a nutty idea for a perfect gift for his wife, Roy took hold of a grappling hook and rope, clambered aboard, and declared it conquered, even making it into the local news of the time. Why did you do it? <clears throat> <laughs> well, I'm not really introspective, really, you know, and I, I never really look for the reasons why I do a lot of I'm not, I'm a, I suppose I'm a maverick. I do the unusual, and I enjoy doing the unusual. And these sort of things uh, don't just tempt me, they attract me like a magnet, and uh, I just have to do them, that's all. He named the disused platform just outside Britain's territorial waters, Sealand. It didn't look like much, but now it was his, and his alone and what a perfect gift for his wife. But it wasn't long before Bates's new nation was challenged in British courts, a colorful story that was reported by American media at the time. The British Navy sent a boat close by. Roy Bates' son, Michael, fired warning shots. Father and son were brought to court, but a judge ruled that since Sealand lay seven nautical miles outside British waters, British courts had no jurisdiction. Bates took that as recognition, created a flag, stamps, passports, and currency with Jones' arresting profile and a motto, E. Mary Libertas, from the sea, freedom. The improbable creation story of the world's tiniest maritime nation was a thumb in the eye of international law. Since Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea was published in 1870, people have dreamed of creating permanent colonies on or under the ocean and reinventing to their advantage the laws that govern. 
La Repubblica del Rosa, an Adriatic version of Sealand, lasted a grand total of 55 days before the Italian government blew it up. Today, the movement to reconquer the oceans has received a new boost from Silicon Valley and Bitcoin investors. The Seasteading Institute envisions water worlds where governments are selected in an open market, taxes can be waived, and climate change can be hacked. We just need to reopen the frontier by building floating cities, city-states on the ocean. And the goal of this is to transform the entire government industry. Named after the homesteads of the American West, seasteads are conceived as self-sufficient, self-governing, part libertarian utopia, part billionaire's playground. In the meanwhile, climate change and rising seas suggest their pioneering sustainable housing and food production may just offer some solutions. This is an amazing opportunity for humanity to redream society. This is not just about exploring and finding new territory or creating micro nation states. We are talking about entire new ways of organizing society with no fixed borders, no divisions, and no limitations. I invite you to journey back to our roots. We came from the ocean and we will go back to the ocean. For all these lofty dreams of building brave new worlds in the outlaw ocean, the Principality of Sealand, half a century old, remains the only micronation standing in open waters to this day. You approach, and it looks unremarkable, but it's a marvel, partially because every other experiment of this sort throughout history has failed within a matter of years. The way you enter this rusty kingdom feels unsafe and slightly ridiculous, but it was so fitting to the rest of the experience. Today, the citizenry of Sealand has dwindled to one. It's this guy named Michael Barrington, who sits out there 24-7 by himself and keeps watch. Barrington, who first came to Sealand 33 years ago after working on pirate radio stations, calls it a big man cave. Where, where would you like your stamp? Anywhere? Anywhere, yeah, yeah. And who, who passes out here? Mostly fishing boats, or who who comes by here? Pilot boats every day. Okay. We've got fishing boats as well. Uh-huh. Um, apart from that, not a lot else. Yeah. Rooms inside the concrete towers include a multi-faith chapel, some are below the waterline, and there's a constant sound of sloshing. I mean, we're underwater now, well, but... Oh, is that right? We'll put the switch on. A small prison cell with an iron bedstead once housed the state's only prisoner in 1978 during an attempted coup. These guys came out of the helicopter. I was here on my own. They came down the windswalk, they waved them away, wanted to get to another one. I ended up being locked in a room for three or four days with no food or anything. Prince Michael was released and exiled, and then with his father, they recaptured Sealand in a dawn raid in a helicopter. Though they released the mercenaries, they held on to the businessman's lawyer, accusing him of treason. Mr. Putz pleaded guilty to a charge of treason. He was eventually freed after a German diplomat came out to investigate, as reported on a local news program. If, if we had a case of treason, to uh, deal yeah. with, we would use this as a courtroom because the jail's down there and then we'd have our picture in there or whatever, so that's that chapel. <laughs> so when we, ex oh, that's when really we execute the bar, <laughs> <laughs> the bar. Oh, this is <laughs> gross. 
bloody weirder and weirder every floor he's going down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> Since then, Sealand has paid its bills and kept afloat by playing host to various companies, including offshore internet server farms and tech firms, renting its space for exhibitions, oddball weddings, or music videos. But one thing was clear to Bates. Sealand was born not out of thievery, but out of conquest, and its governance would remain firmly rooted in ethics and law. It's not a job for right, right. Um, kind of terrorism. Right. If you want to be a country, you've got to act like a country. You're acting like a country and a bit of morality. Right. Taking advantage of a gap in international law, Sealand had grown old, while other attempts at seasteads never made it far beyond what-if imaginings. Perhaps the true secret to Sealand's survival was its limited aspirations. It had no territorial ambitions, it wasn't seeking to create a grand caliphate. In the view of its powerful neighbors, Sealand was merely a rusty kingdom, easier to ignore than to eradicate. Large ships burn the dirtiest fuel on the planet and they are bigger polluters than the aviation or car industries. From bilge to black waters, the sewage of thousands of passengers flushing their toilets several times a day. And sometimes they even resort to the magic pipe. 